Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to the Siege of Vrax, where things are starting to heat up quite drastically. The Death Corps of Krieg has managed to break open uh, the curtain walls of the final Vraxian citadel with a bold mining operation, which undermined the walls themselves and then detonated a huge quantities of explosives beneath them to make them crumble into the dirt. However, the armoured thrust launched by the 308th Regiment to take advantage of the situation had failed. During a whole day's worth of exceptionally bloody fighting, even by Vraxian standards, the 308th had to retreat, leaving the Vraxians in control of the breach, and thusly with the opportunity to fortify and strengthen it. Whilst the first assault had had the advantage of complete and utter surprise, along with the cover provided by the massive dust storm kicked up by the collapse of the curtain walls, and uh, the lack of enemy defences in the breach itself, uh, the second attack would have none of these advantages. Furthermore, the enemy was under no illusions as to where the next assault would be launched, as there really only was one choice. The Death Corps of Krieg would have to make a second attempt upon the breach, and they would. The spearhead would once again be made up of the 308th Regiment, but this time there would be no heedless rush towards the breach. This time they would do it the Death Corps way, and the first step was a two week long preparatory bombardment of the curtain walls, the rearward enemy areas, and the surrounding facilities. The aim of this barrage, which would severely test the 308th reserves of artillery ammunition, was to destroy more of the enemy's wall-mounted guns and automated defence emplacements. It was hoped that by knocking out more of the enemy's wall-mounted weaponry and those mounted inside of the wall itself, they would make up for the fact that this next assault would not have the benefit of the cover of a massive dust cloud. Indeed, this next assault would be advancing over what was, by and large, completely open ground covered by the enemy's guns, and even the deployment of huge quantities of smoke shells would only do so much to obscure their advance since the enemy would have a massive height advantage. Additionally, the enemy's artillery thrown off during the first assault, by their rapidity and the sudden nature of it, they would now have had more than enough time to zero in and turn all of the ground in front of the breach into one massive kill zone. The preparatory barrage also had a secondary purpose. The artillery would of course dedicate the majority of their firepower to the main breach, including of course the identified artillery batteries behind it, which had been spotted by the long-range surveillance aircrafts of the Imperial Aeronautica formations. But the artillery would also dedicate a portion of their firepower to the areas surrounding the main breach. Up and down the wall, they would attempt to scour them clean of wall emplaced weaponry, allowing for an assault on a much wider front. Colonel Tolan of the 308th Regiment was of the opinion that the first assault had only failed because it was carried out on much too narrow a frontage. This was done in part to maintain secrecy, but also because Marshal Kagori wished to pierce through the breach and then, with maximum force, expand upon that breach rapidly, rather than merely just holding it and awaiting reinforcements. This approach, in the Colonel's mind, had failed spectacularly. This time, the full force of the 308th Regiment, reinforced by even more super-heavy elements from the various assault corps, would push on a much wider frontage. The Bane Blades and Shadow Swords would attempt to breach further areas of the massive curtain walls. A tall order, even for their weaponry, but not an impossibility. And at the very least, the mere threat of a secondary or even tertiary breach would force the enemy to hold back some elements of their reserves, and also spread many of their other troops along the length of the curtain walls, instead of focusing all of their strength on a single breach point. There was, however, at least one part of the original plan that did meet with the Colonel's grudging acceptance, and that was the use of the Gorgon Assault Transports. 
The poor little things had seen surprisingly little action on Vrak so far, used almost exclusively to carry reinforcements to the handful of breakthroughs that had already been achieved, or to ferry grenadier formations into the battle line itself. Otherwise, they had been primarily used to shuffle formations around behind the front lines, since they were relatively impervious to enemy artillery barrages. But proper full-on offensive use of these gargantuan transports had almost been entirely limited to the few mass-scale offensives, where their use had practically been ordered from up above. Under Lord Commander Jolka's command, the Death Corps had been rather hesitant to utilize their heavily armored elements in support of the infantry. With the arrival of Marshal Kagori, tanks and super heavies had been used more and more to support the infantry, but the poor Gorgons had still mostly languished in their storage areas. This time, however, they would once again take center stage and deliver the main assault force to its objective. And on 8208 26 millennia 41, the Gorgons started up their engines and began their advance towards the breach. This time they were covered merely by the smoke shells laid by the 308th artillery, and were exposed to a much greater degree than the first assault. This time they did not get away with a mere four Gorgons put out of commission. Several were burning before they'd even reached the halfway mark, and by the time they had finally reached the breach, maybe only half of the Gorgon transports were able to disgorge their infantry complements. Whilst the preparatory bombardment had done its job of softening up the enemy's defences, the fact that they now had clear fields of view, and had been able to reinforce this section of the wall in addition to digging down further anti-tank weaponry around and in the breach meant that the Death Corps armor was phased with a veritable storm of LAS cannon blasts and crack missiles. Nevertheless, some of the assault transports still made it to the main breach and disgorged their assault elements and at the very front of the horde racing up the breach for the second time was Colonel Tolan, the commander of the 308th Regiment who, true to his word, was leading the assault in and up the breach. To the left and the right of the main breach, the super heavy elements had now started battling it out with the wall guns, providing cover for the specialized super heavy tanks like the Shadow Swords and Storm Blades to attempt to create secondary and possibly even tertiary breaches. This work was excruciatingly slow. It required the concentrated firepower of several super heavy tanks to even begin chipping into the massive reinforced curtain walls. And whilst the heaviest of the armoured elements were busy attempting to knock a breach in the wall, they were also of course under constant fire from the wall guns and its automated defensive systems. It was up to the Lehman Russ battle tanks to suppress these as best they could, as the heavier guns would all be required to breach the wall yet again. It took hours, and progress on the main breach was sparse, if noticeable at all. In addition to the additional preparations and defensive positions, the Varaxians had also prepared a series of other surprises for the Death Corps of Krieg. The most troublesome of all of these little inventions were small mines and gas canisters buried in the rubble on the Death Corps side. This meant that as the Corps was clambering up the breach, they would set off small explosive devices which would shred maybe one or a couple of Death Corps soldiers. When they were scrambling up the breach, they might also dislodge rocks, which would fall down and set off yet further devices. Occasionally, the device set off would also be a gas canister, which, whilst in and of itself this proved to be relatively ineffective against the Death Corps, it was still yet another hazard that had to be avoided and countered. Additionally, the Vraxians had also covered the outward slope as best they could in razor wire. Quite a lot of this had been blasted away by the preparatory bombardment, but unsurprisingly, razor wire is never quite so easy to clear, and no matter how much you bombard it, some of it always seems to stick around.
These various impediments made what was already an excruciatingly slow and dangerous operation all the slower and left the death core all the more exposed. Furthermore, without the concentrated fire support of their super heavy and armoured elements, the lead death core formations took devastating casualties. And amongst those casualties was also Colonel Tolan and his entire command squad. The 308th suddenly lost contact with his commander at a moment's notice, presumably because the colonel or one of his command squad members had triggered a particularly large explosive device hidden inside of the wall, or perhaps fallen afoul of an incoming artillery shell. Since contact had been broken so suddenly, it was more than likely that the colonel and his closest bodyguards were all reduced to nothing but a fine red mist. With the loss of its commander, the assault upon the main breach also slowed and eventually halted entirely, with the Death Corps eventually being repulsed on the second assault. There was a piece of good news, however. Two further breaches had been opened in the Citadel's walls. These were much smaller than the main breach, but in accordance with the Colonel's last standing orders, assaults were immediately made upon them. These proved more successful. The enemy had to rush reinforcements to these areas to attempt to stimmy the Death Corps' advance, and the fighting around these two breaches was particularly heavy, with one of the two changing hands a full eight times before finally night fell and the 308th found itself once again forced to retreat. This was to be the last attempt made upon the breach by the 308th Regiment for the time being. The formation had taken such a beating whilst exposed to the Citadel's wall guns that the entire regiment was considered offensively inoperational. They could hold their positions as usual, but it would be no use in any further offensive operations for quite some time. But the breach still needed to be seized, and it was by far the Death Corps' best opportunity yet, especially now that two further smaller breaches had been made and the next attempt upon them would be carried out by the 8th Assault Corps, bringing up yet further super heavy and armoured elements in addition to additional Gorgon transports and Grenadier formations. This time, uh, the breach would be forced open by a weight of firepower, armour and elite troops, and it would appear as if this was to be a success. The third assault made considerably better progress than the preceding two. The two smaller breaches were contested heavily, but the main assault upon the third breach appeared to be gaining solid momentum. An overwhelming force of Gorgon assault transports had, whilst under the cover from Baneblade super heavy tanks and Macarius heavy tanks, approached the walls under the cover of a heavy smoke barrage. Once at the breach itself, the Gorgon transports reversed slightly and then began hosing down the top of the wall with their twin-linked heavy stubbers. Meanwhile, the armoured elements were also firing with all guns, both at the top of the walls and at the breach itself, laying down a murderous suppressive fire. This tactic required several waves of armour, as well as Gorgon transports constantly roll in and out of the battlefield to replenish their ammunition reserves. This also had the added benefit of continuously pouring fresh troops into the combat in a rolling wave style assault. By midday, the Grendiers had reached the top of the main breach. The rest of the day's fighting would go much like the previous days. The Grenadiers had made more in the way of ground than the 308th, but they too could not fully secure the top of the breach. Several times the Grenadiers made it to the very top and threw the Vraxian defenders off it, if but momentarily, before new, massive, human wave style counter assaults from the Vraxians pushed the Grenadiers back down the slope from which they had come, 
Then the grenadiers would rally and push the Vraxians down the reverse slope, and so on, and so on, and so on, for the entirety of the day. Until finally, the third assault also ran into that most unfortunate obstacle that was night time. During the dark of night, the grenadiers could not be effectively supported by their armoured elements. In fact, the artillery and armour could simply not fire up the breach at all for fear of hitting their own men. That may have been something the Vraxians would be willing to risk, but the Death Corps was not quite so careless. The Death Corps is more than happy to take on any sacrifice in the name of the Emperor, but it has to be sacrifice, and firing blind into hordes of your own men that may be intermingled with the enemy, that is not a sacrifice worthy of a man of Krieg. But unfortunately, even with the failure of the third assault, the breach still had to be taken. And so, once again, the 8th Assault Corps prepared to spearhead yet another attempt upon the breaches. This time, the 8th Assault Corps would be supported by the Titans of Legio Astorum, whose return home appears to have been put off somewhat indefinitely. After the Great Breakthrough, everyone was convinced that the war would be over swiftly, including the Titans who had conducted very few offensive operations ever since. But now it was clear that this knot would indeed require a fair bit of further cracking, and so the Titans once again marched into battle alongside the 88th Imperial Guard Siege Army for a fourth massive all-out attempt to seize the breach point. On the 8th Assault Corps' part, little would change from the third attempt. The heavy armoured elements would move up in close support of the Grenadiers, who would be delivered to the foot of the breach via Gorgon Assault Transports, after which they would begin a slow and meticulous crawl up the breach itself, where each Grenadier squad would first provide covering fire to another, and then receive covering fire as they themselves made short, quick runs into a new covered position, from which they could provide cover to the lead elements and and so on and so forth. It was a much slower approach than the mad rush to close quarters combat favoured by their guardsmen brethren, but this suited the Grenadiers' style much better. Additionally, their high-powered Helgans were far better suited to a brief but intense medium-range engagement than close quarters combat. The big difference, of course, this time when compared to the third assault was the additional firepower of the Lego Astorum Titans. They were able to scour the walls clear of automated defences and wall-mounted weaponry at a frightening rate, freeing up the heavy armoured elements to provide continuous directed suppressive fire up towards the breach itself. Every time an enemy heavy gun emplacement was located, the Grenadier commanders would get on the Vox, call down to the tanks below, and guide in a hail of main cannon fire onto the position. And with the Grenadier's slow, steady, and measured advance, they could quickly identify each point of resistance before it became a serious issue, after which they could simply have their friends in the armoured companies obliterate them from afar. The enemy's favoured tactic of swift and brutal counter-assaults was also proving to be considerably less effective this time around. The Grenadiers knew what was coming, and they had brought along additional munitions to deal with it. Every counter-attack was met by a hail of frag grenades, after which covering fire was immediately called in from the armoured elements below, and occasionally even the Titans. And whenever this happened, the top portion of the breach practically just disappeared under a rolling mass of explosions, flame, light, and deafening sound, taking with it anything and everything that may have been trying to charge down it.
And so, with the enemy's counter-attack potential effectively neutered, the Grenadiers finally made it to the top of the breach, where they engaged in a furious spat of combat, with the defenders still dug in at the very top, who had somehow survived the multiple alpha strikes by the armoured elements below. After a short but bloody fight, however, the Grenadiers were finally in command of the breach, and now it was the enemy's turn to clamber their way slowly and painfully up the breach in the face of superior entrenched firepower, with the Grenadiers utilising the various advantages of their higher powered Hellguns to snipe down upon the approaching traitors, and blasting away their cover with concentrated salvos of higher powered LAS fire. Soon, the Grenadiers were also joined by heavy weapons teams, who had been ordered up the breach as soon as the Grenadiers gave the all clear signal. LAS cannons, heavy bolters, missile launchers, and auto cannons were all swiftly being moved into position to provide yet further obstacles for the traitors to overcome. The 8th Assault Corps' Grenadier elements were now well and truly entrenched at the top of the breach, and their embedded watchmasters were calling for additional support to be delivered to them immediately. Engineer elements would soon begin making their way forward along with artillery spotters, to further fortify and prepare the ground behind the breach for further defensive operations. The Grenadiers would now hold on until nightfall, and then, morning of the next day, all available reserves, including those of the 8th Assault Corps and neighbouring siege regiments, would be thrown through the breach and into the citadel. Even as the last few dregs of enemy defenders were retreating hastily down the sides of the breach, the 8th Assault Corps had managed what the 308th had not, seizing and holding the breach, and now all that remained was to make it secure. Already, Grenadier observers were starting to guide in the zeroing fire from the Death Corps' artillery batteries to create a box barrage and a lethal kill zone beyond the breach. A battery command officer was in contact with just such a spotter, talking to him over a long-range voxcaster, when the transmission suddenly cut out mid-sentence. Suspecting some sort of failing or ailing humours on behalf of the machine spirit, the battery officer stood up from his desk and prepared to go call for one of the adepts attached to his battery, when what felt like a semi-solid wall of air slapped him in the face, and pushed him down onto his back. As he was picking himself up and regaining his senses, he heard the sound of loud thuds reverberating through the structure of his bunker. The occasional enemy artillery barrage or shower of fragmentation shells was hardly a rare occurrence, but this did not sound like the usual fire. Looking out from the observation trenches, you could quickly see why. It was raining large pieces of rock down from the sky, and off in the distance towards the main breach, a gargantuan mushroom cloud was reaching slowly towards the sky. The Vraxians, realising that they could not hold on to the trench for a third time, and detonated a presumably massive counter-mine charge, blowing the entire breach sky high, sending rocks and pieces of grenadiers flying for kilometres in every direction. The detonation quite immediately and effectively put a halt to the fourth assault. The Death Corps of Krieg is a remarkably stubborn group of guardsmen, but this was a bit much even for them. And with this grandiose riposte to the fourth assault upon the breaches, no further attempts would be made this year. Meanwhile, in Imperial General Headquarters, Marshal Arnim Kagori sat at his grand ornamental desk, reassessing and re-evaluating the situation on Vrax. The attempts upon the breaches had been necessary, but also exceedingly costly, drawing off resources from the rest of the front line, and noticing this and realising that possibly the best way to protect the breaches 
was to place pressure upon the Death Corps in other areas. The Varaxians, along with their chaotic allies, had launched continuous attacks all along the front line, which were, of course, responded to in kind by the Death Corps' own counterattacks. Both armies had spent the last few weeks and months battering away at one another with near unprecedented ferocity. What was worse was an increase in the activity of the Chaos Space Marines. Along the main front lines, they were more and more often leading the assaults launched from the Vraxian trenches. And to the north, the worshippers of Nurgle were getting more and more active every day that passed further exacerbating an already supremely trying position on behalf of the 1st Lion Corps, who had to fight in a downright lethal environment. The continuous usage of chemical and biological weapons from both sides had turned much of the Northern Front into little more than a poisonous bog. It had gotten so bad, in fact, that both forces were now extremely hesitant to launch any further attacks over this exceptionally treacherous terrain. Even the worshippers of Nurgle found this to be a little bit much, and if even they were raising an eyebrow at the conditions, you can only imagine how bad they must be for the mere mortals of the Death Corps of Krieg. Instead, the fighting on the Northern Front was more and more spilling over onto the extreme flank of the front line. It would almost appear as if the worshippers of Nurgle were attempting to outflank the Death Corps, but the terrain in that direction was inhospitable, even by Vraxian standards, and it appeared difficult to believe that they would make a major attempt to outflank the Corps altogether. Nevertheless, it does not pay to be complacent particularly in the face of chaos, and so Death Rider and Light Armoured Companies were constantly scouring the area, and engaged in nigh-on, never-ending skirmishes with enemy scouts and advanced elements. All the way out here on the extreme northern front, the war had taken on an altogether new and unfamiliar aspect, at least to the Vraxian theatre. Instead of the static trench lines of massed gun batteries or huge tank battles followed by vast infantry wave-style assaults, the war here was far more fluid and smaller. Groups of Death Riders would lay in wait in the endless plains or hiding in shallower ravines, from which they would launch ambushes upon passing convoys of traitors. Likewise, the enemy's Chaos Space Marines or cultists might in turn attempt to ambush the Death Corps elements. Lone Salamander scout tanks on extended recon missions were prime targets for the enemy's attention, not only due to the possibility of acquiring a valuable light vehicle, but also the even more delicious possibility of acquiring a mid-ranking Corps officer. Leaders and commanders were also valuable targets for the Death Corps, since another element that was heavily engaged on this particular part of the front line was both sides' aerial forces, with spotters both on the Vraxian, Chaos, and Krieg sides scouring the landscape and calling in coordinates for sudden and brutal attacks from above. And since the area was simply so vast, it was virtually pointless for the various formations to bring along their own dedicated triple A. Not only would these larger vehicles kick up more dust, therefore exposing the column to detection, but they were also large, noisy, and when they fired into the sky, a somewhat necessary action if they were to carry out their intended tasks, they were essentially raising up a massive sky-high sign to anybody who was watching with huge block letter inscriptions, I am here. Come fuck me, please. On the Northern Front, uh, discretion was most certainly the better part of valour. Both sides became quite adept at utilising the various ravines as covered routes of approach and travel, 
Both sides developed vast and intricate maps, showing which routes were passable at which times, which might be blocked by torrential downpours at a moment's notice, which ones were risky because they might be turned into rivers at a moment's notice, and which ones could be made passable with a little work. Both sides' engineered elements were quite busy, building improvised bridges and clearing out some of the more uncooperative terrain. Unsurprisingly, the capture of such a map was the Holy Grail itself, and whenever one of the sides managed to get a hold of one, it led to a sudden upsurge in their own activity and a drastic increase in their opposition's casualties. For the time being, however, neither side appeared to be gaining much in the way of a decisive advantage on this, the most extreme of the Vraxian siege's flanks. And unless one side could gain such an advantage, large-scale troops' movement through this area would be hazardous at best and damn near suicidal at worst, as any large-scale movements were bound to be noticed very quickly indeed, and harried constantly by attacks from the enemy's lighter elements and attacks from the air. Additionally, any attempt at subterfuge or a surprise attack would almost certainly all be utterly futile. And speaking of subterfuge, the Alpha Legion appeared to have gotten back into the swing of things. Whilst their appearances on the front line had grown ever rarer since the arrival of the additional Chaos reinforcements, there had been a sharp uptick in covert activity, presumably carried out by the Alpha Legion's own operatives and their Chaos Space Marines. Artillery batteries, gun bunkers, and rearward supply depots were being attacked and destroyed at a frightening rate, and the only seemingly adequate response to this activity was to beef up guard duty along virtually the entirety of the 88's positions, which would be yet another severe drain on the Siege Army's manpower, a drain that Marshal Kagori right now could really do without. And so, at the end of the year, very little had truly changed from the great breakthrough of Marshal Kagori's first offensive. The war underground, whilst still ongoing, had reached almost as complete a stalemate as the war above ground. The enemy had quite clearly learned their lesson, and were not about to be surprised by any large-scale mining operations again. So far, the Death Corps engineers had almost breached their citadel permanently, and possibly put an end to the war, and also almost breached into their main underground armory, imperiling God Emperor only knows what vast quantities of equipment, weaponry, and supplies. If the Vraxians hadn't gotten the message before this that the Death Corps engineers were to be taken very seriously indeed, they most certainly had gotten it now. And another message that was felt loud and clear this time by the Death Corps of Krieg was that Legio Vulcanum, the traitor titans, were still out there. They had taken a severe drumming at the hands of Legio Astorum, but they had recently become more active once again, launching or supporting small assaults up and down the front line, forcing the titans of Legio Astorum to redeploy to cover the larger areas involved. This effectively prevented the Imperial Titans from focusing all of their attentions on one small area, which had been the key to the success of Marshal Kagori's first offensive. But at least there was one piece of good news all the way at the end of yet another year of the Siege of Vrax. And that was that despite several attempts made by Imperial picket ships scouring the outer system of Vrax, the grand old monster known as the Anarchy's Heart had not resurfaced, and no sign of its presence in system had been found. It was, of course, conceivable that it was once again utilizing whatever foul Dark Mechanica's magic had hidden it from detection during Marshal Kagori's fleet first arrival in system, but it had been quiet for so long now that it seemed unlikely that it was still around.
Perhaps its wounds had been even more severe than first anticipated, and the battleship had slinked off out of the system without anybody noticing. If that was the case, then at least one worry had been lifted from Marshal Kagori's heavy, heavy shoulders. His supply lines would no longer be under threat from the enemy battleship. It may appear small solace, but it was just about the only one he currently had, and the clamour from his various political rivals so thoroughly shut up after his first offensive had slowly but surely begun to rise in volume and frequency once again, as it was made clear that the war on Vrax would still continue for quite some time. This fact had also begun to raise the ire of certain forces within the Adeptus Administratum, which were starting to become somewhat disillusioned with the war in its entirety. The Imperium needed soldiers for other wars, and if Marshal Kagori could not end the war swiftly, then other, more pressing concerns might start to take precedence. And on that somewhat foreboding note, I will wrap up yet another video on the Siege of Vrax. Until next time, I have been Arch. Thank you all very much for watching, and I hope to see you all again soon. Until then, have a good day.